speaking from and what he's writing. John is uh, the beloved disciple of Jesus. He also wrote, as, as uh, Hannah spoke earlier, he also wrote the book of John and the three letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And this letter particularly was thought to be written to the church of Ephesus, uh, to the believers there, which is wonderful because it was also passed to several other believers, and it is very applicable to us today as believers. So this, even though this, this letter was written 2,000 years ago, it is extremely applicable to us uh, today, as we're going to see. The church that is written to was, had witnessed a major exodus. A lot of people had left the church. Um, a lot of this um, was, caused confusion in the church, along with false teachers coming in, the, the, the believers of, of the church of that time were left with the question, are we really saved? And so that's, what, that's really what we're going to look at today is, is this con concept of John is trying to instill confidence into the believers of the church, looking at the redemptive work of Jesus Christ in their life so that they would be able to ultimately love one another as the passage looks at today. And I think that's such a timely message for us today as we look at the world around us, thinking of what do we need in our world? Well, we see what's not working, right? And we as believers have the opportunity to be an example, to show love to those closest to us and to the world around us. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Before we dive into the text, would you please bow your heads and let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Jesus, we just thank you for the blessed opportunity that we have to come here this morning to study your word. We thank you for this message from John, We ultimately, Lord, who wrote it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it is your word, Lord. We just pray that your word today would penetrate our hearts, that it would expose uh, our own sin, Lord, that it would show us areas in our lives that we can work on in our own lives, Lord. And we thank you that your word is living and active. We thank you that uh, it was applicable 2,000 years ago as it is today, Lord. Father, we just pray that you would be working in each and every one of our hearts. Father, we just pray for the many needs of our congregation. Lord, we just pray for Helene Van Dyken. Pray for the, the just wisdom. Uh, pray for the doctors to just know what to do there, Lord, and, and, and how best to, to treat her. Uh, just pray for their whole family, Lord. Pray for Paul Kroger as he's recovering from a, a surgery on his hip this week, Lord. Just pray that that would be uh, just a quick recovery there. Uh, just pray for those uh, that, are, that are hurting in, in this congregation, Lord. There's many who have lost loved ones recently. Uh, just pray that you would just give uh, just an abundance of, of your peace and your love to them. Father, we pray for those that are serving our country. Pray for Mark Thompson. Devin Reagan and Clay Cantrell as they are overseas serving. Uh, pray that you would just grant them safe return, Lord, uh, this fall. Thank you for their willingness uh, and, and to do that, Lord. And we pray for Pastor Mark. Lord, I just thank you for the couple of weeks that he has got to spend with his family. Just pray that he would be recharged, that he would be refreshed uh, to come back next week, Lord, and to continue to minister to this congregation and to faithfully preach your word. So, Father, we just, we just thank you for this time, and we just, um, yeah, give this time to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I believe 1 John chapter 3, um, verses 11 through 18 will be on the board, but if you have your Bibles, that would be great to turn to it as well. And so, I'd like to read through the entire text at this time, and then reflect on it. So, 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? 
Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Okay. So as we look at this, just kind of going back to John's perspective, John is old at this point as he, when he wrote the letter, and he's, written, he's, he's talking to second and third generation Christians. As I said before, they're beginning to doubt as a result of many false teachers. They, the way to truth had become mystical and almost unattainable, and John wanted to make it very clear to his hearers and to his audience that there, he did not want there to be any confusion God doesn't want there to be any confusion. John wanted his audience to live in the confidence of their relationship and their standing before Jesus. And so I began to think about, you know, as we look at what caused doubt in in the early church, what causes doubt today? And as we think about that, there's so many messages out there that are contrary to the gospel message, right? We think of even just the prosperity gospel or works-based righteousness, things like that, things that creep into our mind and begin to think, well, what does the gospel really say? And I love how Pastor Mark continually says, you got to preach the gospel to yourself every single day, right? The true gospel, what, what does that look like? And so the world is filled with false messages. The father of lies would love for you to believe any number of them that's going to pull you away from your relationship with Jesus Christ. Scripture points out uh, that there's going to be, there have been and will be many false teachers. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Paul again in Acts says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Jesus himself in, in Matthew said, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And Paul again says in 2 Timothy, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Sounds like a lot of what's going on today, I believe, in our world, right? People want to to believe something other than the gospel. Well, I hope today that we leave here today with a reassurance of Christ's work in our life. The, the question that was asked, are we really saved? John wants us to be assured. God wants you to be assured. God wants you to live in confidence. I remember growing up, and I can't tell you how many times I asked the Lord into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. And I guess it, I didn't quite grasp the concept of Man, once you commit your life to Jesus Christ, there is, there is security there, right? But the father of lies wants you to not believe that. And so John wrote this letter. He wants you to know that eternity is secure. In fact, in 1 John 5.13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life, Okay. Praise God for that. There is, there is a possibility that we can know. Now, I want to I make one clarification here between two words that I've already used. And one is security and one is assurance. It's important to distinguish between the two that security, eternal security, refers to the believer's unchanging standing before, before God. A born-again believer does not need to worry about losing their salvation because Jesus Christ's work on the cross was sufficient for past sin, present sin, and future sin. Amen, right? And so that is, that is security. All Christians from the strongest to the weakest are certain to enter into eternity with Jesus Christ. Every born-again believer okay, has eternal security, whether he knows it or not, whether he feels it or not. Assurance on the contrast, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, is, re- refers to whether a believer knows or even lives in a way that they are saved. All born-again believers are, are secure, but not all believers have the assurance of salvation. Having the confidence of the work, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ in their life. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So how can we live with this assurance? I am, I'm glad you asked. So we're going to be looking at the evidence of Christ's work in our lives. So born-again Christians have the Holy Spirit to guide them. Christ is at work 
transforming, the transforming power of Christ is at work in believers' lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we are a new creation. Being a new creation, we now have the ability to love one another. We have the ability to willingly obey God's commands. We have the ability to live in him. John, throughout 1 John, he's pointed out and using several tests that these evidences in one's life should point to this assurance. Today's evidence that we're going to be looking at is loving one another. So let's go ahead and take a look at verse 11. There it is right there. Excellent. Uh, it says, For this, me- this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Okay, there's an easy mistake that we can make right now to make this extremely works-based. And I don't want you to take away from this today to say, I'm going to go love my brother better to be a better Christian. Okay? What we need to do is we need to look to Christ so that we can love one another better. Okay? And so that's what we're looking at today. As a believer, we have the redemptive work of Jesus Christ in our lives. Because he showed love to us, we are now able to love one another. John's not trying to send the message of seven steps to be a better Christian. He's sending them the message of this is what it should look like because Jesus Christ is in your life. And on the contrary to that, if that evidence is not in your life, then you might ask yourself, why not? Where is my relationship with Jesus Christ? So as we look at this first verse here in verse 11, John uses the words from the beginning. I think it's ironic or intentional, actually, that he uses the words from the beginning. This is, the, this is not a new fad that these Christians uh, were looking for. This is the message from the Lord Jesus himself. You see, Jesus said this, uh, if we look back to John 13, he says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus states this immediately following washing the disciples' feet, and shortly after, giving his own life, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate love for mankind. Okay? So this is the, this is the message that, that was preached long ago. The people of the time were looking for the, the new fad. What's next? What's new? What can I, what can I get out of uh, the world, the message, the message from the world? People are looking for something new. John was bringing them back to the basics, as Pastor Mark has titled this series, Back to the Basics, and that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at back to the basics of loving one another. As a teacher myself, I look at John, and I think he must have been a good student because he references much of Jesus' teaching. Okay, Jesus taught John, and much of this teaching is coming from, from Jesus' teaching, and a lot of it's actually from the Sermon on the Mount. And so I must note great students when I see them. So So let's continue in the text. As we look at the text, we see uh, all the way through 1 John, we've noticed that John uses stark contrasts. He's been, he's trying to prove several points and he uses uses vivid contrasts to prove his point. Uh, Two weeks ago, Pastor, Pastor Mark preached on children of God or children of the devil. Great contrast there. John has also used light and darkness He's used a new commandment, old commandment. We see him talking about love of the Father or love of the world. He talked about Christ and the Antichrist, truth versus lies. And today we're going to be looking at love in contrast to hatred. So what does it look like? Well, John actually starts out with an explanation of what it does not look like. And so as we look at verse 12, It says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. I would like to spend just a moment to look at this uh, in Genesis chapter 4. And so it will be up on the board, but you can turn there as well. And so... The readers of the time, the audience of this letter, would have been very familiar, as many of you are, of the story of Cain and Abel. Okay, But I just want to look at it and kind of, what is, what is God looking at here? Why did, why did John bring up this story? So, 
Let's go ahead and read Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 8 says this. It says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is, has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in, in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So John brings this up as a very vivid contrast of this is what it does not look like to love your brother. Now, it's interesting as we look at this, as we look at the heart of this passage, it's all about the heart. You see, Cain's offering was clearly not what the Lord wanted, but what it did is it revealed his heart. It revealed his sinful heart. Abel did not wrong his brother. Abel, Abel simply brought the, the right offering, which pleased the Lord, and Cain did not. And it revealed Cain's heart of jealousy, which ultimately led to anger and hatred, which led to murder. And so it's, it's, it's interesting as we look at this text to think of the reason that Cain killed Abel was because Abel did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so as we look at this, and we look at verse 13 of 1 John 3, it says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. So what can we expect if we fulfill this, right? If, if you'd think, if we loved our brother, love, love our neighbor, love, love one another well, what, what should we, we, we would expect? Well, they're going to love us back. But the verse here says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Why would the world hate us for doing what is right? Well, I believe that when someone is living in righteousness, righteous living often does one of two things. It can often spur others on to like righteousness or a like relationship with Jesus Christ. Righteous living can also bring out conviction in someone's life. If you're the only one in a group of people that's not swearing, not gossiping, not getting drunk, the people around you may begin to feel conviction because of that righteous living, the pursuit of righteousness, I should say. And so if the world feels convicted, they may resent you that you're living in righteousness. And looking at this, ver this verse here, do not be surprised that the, that the world is going to resent you for this, as we saw in the story of Cain and Abel. Why, why would people hate righteousness? Why would people hate the light? Ultimately, the light exposes their evil deeds, and it makes them feel convicted they don't like it, and they respond in hatred. Well, all that being said, and I hope that wasn't too much of a rabbit trail, but all that being said, we know what we don't want it to look like. We know we don't want it to look like Cain. And so what do we want it to look like? We know that we want it to look like Jesus Christ. That's where we want to draw our attention today, is Jesus Christ. And how do we know that we are truly found in Jesus Christ? We look at verse 14, which I call this the assurance statement, okay? John uses the word know in here because that's what he wants. He wants us to know. Verse 14 says this, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. As we look at this, Again, John wants us to know that we have passed out of death into life because we have the evidence of love in our hearts. Verse 15 can be a little bit confusing as we think about Christ's redemptive work in, in a person's life, becoming a new creation. This verse is not stating that anyone who commits murder is condemned automatically. Okay? This is generalizing someone whose life is characterized or generalized by murder. 
You see, once someone commits Jesus Christ to their life, they are no longer classified as a murderer. They are now a child of God. And that is what characterizes a believer, is that they are now a child of God. Somebody could commit murder and give their life to Christ and now ultimately spend eternal life with Jesus Christ. So I just want to clarify that just, just to make sure. But we do see the seriousness of anger and murder, and it's not to be taken lightly. Looking back at verse 14, if you have the love in your hearts towards one another, this is the evidence that Jesus Christ's redemptive work is in your life. As I was preparing this sermon, I was challenged with a thought of, is the world able to love? If this is evidence that we're looking for in our lives to, to basically to reassure us that we are believers, what is, can the world love? And I would say, yes, people in the world can love. Okay? But what is the tendency of the world? And I think we have to look at what is the world's motive in love. Okay? Why does the world love? And I believe that the world, and I'm generalizing here, I apologize for that, but I believe the world looks at a situation and weighs the benefits of giving love. What do I get out of this? What do I gain from this situation? Okay, what if I, recognition, social promotion, even to the extent of if I love my wife well, doesn't that benefit me? There I say happy wife, happy life, right? Happy spouse, happy house. And if I extend that love, I get, I get benefit from it. And I think the world weighs out those options. Even, even to the point of loving your children can be just an extension of loving yourself as well. And so as we look at this and we, we think, okay, so the world can love, but what kind of love are we talking about? Hannah did a great job in the children's message this morning of, of, of using the word love in ways that really aren't what Christ showed us, right? We love chocolate. I love fishing. I love these types of things. But it's different than what Christ is talking about. It's different than what Christ displayed for us. Christ displayed a selfless love, an absolute no expectation of return kind of love. And that's what, that's what John is talking about here when he says to love one another. This is a sacrificial love. Now, you might be like me in this thinking, oh man, if this is so, to be an evidence in my life, I'm not very good at this. <laughs> I struggle. There, believe it or not, there are people in my life that I struggle to love. Well, that's because you and I, we're still living on this earth in our earthly bodies as sinners. And we need Jesus Christ's work in our life. And it's only through Jesus Christ that we, are, we even have the ability to love one another. And I look at Philippians 1.6, and I love this verse. It says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I'm a work in progress. Okay? But the Holy Spirit works in my life in those relationships. And I know through that conviction, I have a desire to love that person. Not good at it, but I have a desire and the Holy Spirit prompts me to do that. And I want to do that for the right reasons. That sacrificial love that we're talking about. So how do we do this? Well, we look to Christ, right? Look at Christ's example. Romans 5, 6. I love this verse. It says, For while we were still weak, the NIV uses the word powerless, okay? While we were still weak, Weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for us because we're great. He didn't die for us because we'd done something wonderful. He died for us while we were ungodly. Romans 5 8 says this, but God shows his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Once again, it wasn't because I had done something wonderful. He died for, for you and for me when we were sinners, when we had nothing to offer. Praise God for that. In fact, if we look back earlier, it says the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserved. But Christ sacrificially laid his life down for us to show us this example of love 
for us, this is the model of what we should be looking at and looking to and relying on Christ. How do we respond to this? Well, our first step, the first step is to make sure that we've committed our lives to Jesus Christ, right? And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this, but if, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That verse was so instrumental in my gaining confidence and assurance of my own salvation of thinking, yeah, it, that's what you do. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, and there's a, probably a whole other sermon right there, but to, to, to truly have Jesus Christ as Lord of your life means that he is truly in charge and is Lord of your life. But when you commit your life to Jesus Christ, as we spoke of earlier, you are a new creation. You are something different than you were in the past, and you are now able to fully live for him. So what's our application today? Again, how do we respond? As believers, how do we respond? Well, what does this look like practically? I think John does a fantastic job as we look at verses 17 and 18 to lay this out as to what does this look like practically in our world today? Verse 17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Verse 18, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. There are so many needs in our world today. As we look around, there are, there are an unbelievable amount of hurting people for whatever reason. There's multiple reasons that we all know of. There are, there are, there are so many people who are in need of, maybe they're lonely, maybe they're in need of, of physical items, or whatever the case, there are people in need. And we have the opportunity as believers to show the world around us, what that can look like, what true love looks like, what Christ did. We have, the, we have the opportunity to show the example of Christ to those around us. I just want to remind you, though, that you will not be able to do this on your own strength. Okay, The only way that we're going to be able to do this and to be representatives of Jesus or like Jesus is to spend more time with him. To be Christ-like, we need to spend time with him. Many of you remember... I did the children's message several weeks ago, and I brought this tree branch in, and it had these little tiny baby apples on it, and I was all excited because my wife is able to make really good apple pie, and I later was informed that that branch would no longer produce apples worthy of apple pie. <laughs> and so that message there was to talk about we need to abide. That branch needs to abide or be plugged into the source of the tree. Okay, and that's the only way that we are going to be able to display this love that we're talking about is you need to abide in Christ. What that looks like, we talked about that day, spending time in God's Word, spending time in prayer, sp spending time with the one who we want to be like, right? Who we want to imitate. Where does this start? I think about this starts in our closest relationships, this starts at home. I think of our home, and man, there's, there's lots of ways to love. When you've got three little children, man, you've got diapers, you've got midnight bottle feedings, you've got dishes, you've got to wash the bottles, you've got, there's, there's, it's, there's an act of service there. And I pray to God that I can have the strength to do that even a little bit well. But there's so many needs in your given household that you can start to show the love of Christ to those around you. Take that circle a little bit farther. Look around. We have the circle of, of our believers around us, our own church. As the world looks into our church, as they watch us, do they see something different? Do they see the sacri sacrificial love between believers? I hope so. Okay? I, I pray that they do. And I'm confident that we can, do, we can do a better job of that as we look to Christ. Okay? We can be focused on Christ so that we can love our fellow believers. And then, of course, man, there's so many opportunities with coronavirus and all the different things going on in our world today. There's opportunity to love the world. I had a great conversation. It was actually last Sunday night. I went fishing with a friend, and he, he brought up 
he brought up this question of how are we to respond to coronavirus? And I, my sinful heart was kind of over it. <laughs> Confess my sins from the pulpit. Okay. But that, that was my response. And he corrected me and said, you know, we need to see this as an opportunity. It presents an opportunity to be different than what the world is, how the world is responding. It's, we have an opportunity to love in a way that the world is not loving one another. Okay? And, and, I, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to bring conviction to any of you. I, I pray that the Lord's word is, is working in your heart today. But I know in my own heart, man, I know there's lots of opportunities. There's lots of missed opportunities uh, that, I, that I pass up. And there's lots of ways that, that I can love people better than I'm doing. Okay, And so I challenge you to, to think of who in your life can you extend this sacrificial, the sacrificial love, this no expectation of anything in return kind of love. Now, as, as, we, as we begin to bring this to an end here, and I, I just want to want to make it clear that John was not intending for this message, and neither do I. I don't mean to condemn you in any way. This is, this is actually a message of, it's a message of hope. It's a message of reassurance to say, wow, I do feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit. I do feel God's work in my life. I do feel that desire to show Christ to the world around me. And through his power, it's a message of hope. The message of hope is the fact that I can't, I, if I try to do this on my own, I'm not going to be able to do it. But if I abide in Christ, I can love those around me. Okay, and so rely on, rely on Christ. Verse 19, I wasn't, I was actually going to only preach to verse 18, but verse 19 says this, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. John wants us to live in that confidence. Jesus Christ wants us to live in the confidence that we can go to our neighbor, that we can share Christ to those around you. I want you to be encouraged from this message that, yeah, Christ's work, he has redeemed me. I am a new creation. I am something, something new, something different than I used to be. I am something different than the world. You see, 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. And if God is love and if he is in us, we should have an overflow of that to people around us. Romans 5, 5 says that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has, who has been given to us as believers. He has been poured into us so that we can pour into others. And I want you to, I want you to leave today as believers, if you are a born-again believer, that you can be assured and walk in that confidence. And my last challenge to you is this. As we examine our hearts, and if there is no desire, and if you don't see any redemptive work in your life, I, I challenge you to ask yourself, where, where do you stand with Jesus Christ today? And, and, and have you committed your life to Jesus Christ today? And I challenge you, if you have not, this may today be the day of salvation. May you commit your life to Jesus Christ and experience his redemptive work in your life. So that is my prayer for you. And so as I, as I close today, I want you to be encouraged as you, as you look at, at what Christ has done in your life, what he's doing in your life, and to apply that to the world today. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Jesus, we, we thank you for, for what you have done for us. Lord, as a song we sang earlier, Lord, we need you in order to do this. Help us to not try to do this on our own strength, but to rely fully on you. And we do thank you that we have the opportunity to love one another, that we have the opportunity to be examples of Jesus Christ to the people in our world today. Pray that you would strengthen us to do so. Lord, I just thank you for each person that has been here today to hear your word. I pray that you would just bless them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand and do the closing song.
in life You are love You bring light To the darkness You give hope You restore Every heart That is broken And great benediction comes from Romans 15 verses 5 and 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. May you all have a blessed day.